My name is Colette Mazzuccelli. In the Classical Theories and Contemporary Issues in International Relations online seminar, taught by me for Long Island University Global since 2015, it is our responsibility in service to transnational civil society during this unprecedented time of COVID-19 to listen to non-governmental organizations, notably the Syrian Emergency Task Force, which accomplishes political, economic, and legal work to raise awareness about the most pressing, critical humanitarian issue of this early 21st century. We appreciate the occasion to launch this podcast series, Global Connections, Syrian Hidden Voices, to discuss the ways in which the Syrian Emergency Task Force is engaging across countries to bring hope, hope to the orphans, the displaced, the women, the detainees in Syria. Our learning, research, and service aim to make a difference in a fragile world impacted increasingly by the novel coronavirus pandemic, which exacerbates underdevelopment and violence as personal freedom and human rights are consistently violated. It is our hope that the peoples of Syria may one day be able to live in peace together in the country they love. As we study international relations, we take responsibility in our learning to link concepts and practice in the vision of world education articulated by Morris Mitchell and elaborated by his colleagues in Friends World College during the 1960s to this day. In this podcast series, we remain faithful to Mitchell's vision as the legacy of Friends World College lives on in the lives of our LIU Global alumni. Thank you, Muaz and Omar, for joining this podcast today. We look forward to our evolving cooperation with the Syrian Emergency Task Force in this Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices podcast series. Welcome to our second episode of Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices. As always, my name is Olivia Stevens and I am your host. In our last episode, we talked about the beginnings of the Syrian Revolution and in turn the beginnings of the Syrian Emergency Task Force. If you haven't heard it already, now would be a great time to go back and listen to our first episode so that you can get all caught up. In this episode, we are hearing more from Muaz Mustafa, specifically about the Caesar Files. Again, a big thank you to the Syrian Emergency Task Force and to you, our dear listener. Before we begin, a content warning. This episode contains descriptions of war crimes, violence, murder, and torture. Mulaz, you briefly mentioned the Caesar Files and how people were still trying to be identified in the photos today. Where did these photos come about and what might be the dangers of producing these photos? So the Caesar File, um, named after the code name uh, we gave, the photographer, Caesar, all come from a specific snapshot both in time and geography in Syria. They are from Damascus and the 24 intelligence security branches, detention centers, concentration camps, whatever you want to call them. So just in Damascus and its surrounding area and only for about two and a half years, from March 15, 2011. And again, by the dictator's own admission, there was a year of nonviolent protests, yet the military of the Assad regime, the security forces, and everybody was mobilized to go after these defenseless civilians. And so from March 15, 2011 until 2013, about August, September. Um, and just to give a quick background, Caesar was a military, a forensic photographer within the military police. So his job, pre-revolution was if there were any accidents or incidents under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense, he would go and take photographs of the scene and submit that with a report to the military courts. So let's say there was a car crash, a drowning, a fire, a suicide, um, etc. But in, in March 15, 2011, as these protests had broken out, he was asked to go to a military hospital in Damascus and take photographs of instances of death under, uh, within, in the intelligence branches in Damascus. And when Caesar arrived, he saw 15 bodies that were brutally tortured and killed. And he 
assumed that these were civilians. I mean, that was his perception. These were the same people out there protesting. And initially, the protests weren't to change the regime. They were just to provide little reforms, to give dignity uh, and, and, and a small amount of freedom to, to the Syrian people. Of course, that developed into transition to a democracy once the people saw the true brutality of their government. And for Caesar himself, someone who initially is apolitical, working within the regime's Ministry of Defense as a, as a military police uh, forensic photographer, sees this and is shocked. This is his own government, and it has done this to his own you know, uh, you know, people just like him, Syrian nationals. And so he wanted nothing to do with this. He wanted to get out. Um, and talking to a close friend, reached out to a group within sort of uh, outside of Syria, and uh, you know, a group in the opposition that includes us. And we and he. Um, and he was, he wanted to leave, he wanted to defect um, and go. And so the answer was, yes, happy to help you get out, um, but would you stay? And surprisingly, and very courageously by Caesar, he remained for those two and a half years. Um, so in that time, what he would do is every day, he would go take photographs of the dead of that day. And although at the beginning it was about 15 bodies a day, by the end of the first year, he was taking photographs of like 50, 60 bodies every single day. And that number kept rising to the point where they were no longer using the military hospital's mortuary room for, um, you know, to take those photos. They started using the garage. And one thing that I think is really important for people to understand, and sometimes we forget to say it, the, the military hospital where Caesar took the vast majority of the photographs of the people, because people get killed in the intelligence branches and then they're processed every single day at this military hospital. They started using its garage outside because it was just no, not enough space when you're looking at 70 bodies a day that are, that are tortured to death, mangled up, acid poured on them, eyes gouged, the most sadistic stuff you could imagine, emaciated, um, and... And they would bag them up in, 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 in plastic bags. And we still don't know what happens to these bodies. <clears throat> we are, we assume confidently that they're being cremated. We know, you know, we can get into that. But um, so Caesar would take those photos and then he would go home. And every night he would sneak out, not just the photos he took, but the photos that the other photographers that worked under him for the state had taken from the computer in his headquarters office in Damascus, and he would go and put them on a laptop um, near his home. And he did this daily. And every single day, if he was captured with that flash drive or with the memory cards, he knows that he would be, you know, exactly the people that are on the other side of his lens. Um, and he knows how brutal his, his murder would be. At the same time, if he's captured by the rebels, the opposition, the fighters that were uh, trying to defend the protests, or as, as things became more violent, they're, they're the defectors from the military that didn't want to shoot up their own people and, and, and so on, if they would have caught Caesar, they would have killed him too, because he's someone who's working in this machinery of death. Um, and so for him, it was incredibly brave. That can never be overstated. To do what he has done, and after two and a half years, we came into a situation where it was simply too dangerous um, for details we can't share publicly. And so that's when Caesar was snuck out of Syria um, with all the documentation and the photos, including documents that showed command responsibility. Um, but just to go back, that military hospital I mentioned is less than like a kilometer away from uh, the presidential palace. It's, it's within a few kilometers, actually. It's like it's like a kilometer and a little bit, sorry, just to be more accurate. And it's a straight, direct line of sight. If, if the dictator went to his window and looked out of his window, he would see the garage where 70 bodies of Syrian Arabs and Kurds and Christians and Muslims and the whole mosaic of Syrian people are being processed. And then another batch of people that have been tortured and comes in the next day and it goes on. And so um, Caesar got out. Um, we helped 
uh, and we continue to work with him closely, not just in terms of the legal work, but in terms of, you know, raising awareness and pursuing and talking to governments to to do something to end the killing. <clears throat> he often says in meetings at the White House or when he testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee or this past March when he and, and Omar as well testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I mean, Caesar says the people I took photos of, we got to give them justice, but they're gone. Every They're dead. And there are hundreds of thousands that are facing the same fate, a slow and horrible death that's, uh, that's ongoing for them that we must save. I'm sorry to, to have such a long-winded answer, but um, I can speak, I think, for hours just about Caesar's story. But that's the origin of those photographs. And they're just a small example of the ongoing torture to death of civilians that continues to this day. They still number the bodies like they do. They put them in bags. They take the photographs. And the reason they do that is when we showed the world these photos, the world at the beginning showed outrage, but little to no action. And that's that's what we are still working to do to deter and to stop these criminals from what they're doing. It's, it's truly a never again moment. Thank you so much for that explanation. And I think you said it really right at the end that it's like the action that is needed. So as an outsider to this class and as an outsider to the issue, I feel like I've learned so much just with this brief conversation. So thank you so much for taking the time to explain that to us. It's so important. On behalf of the LIU Global Community, the Going Global Podcast, and the Syrian Emergency Task Force, we thank you, dear listener, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and we'll leave you with Syrian music thanks to producer James Mirabello.